position at the city of Miami? I'm the, the Wimby manager. Oh, good. Yeah, still the Wimby manager. Agreed. Yeah. So anybody who applied for that position is now bid. It's been filled. <laughs> Uh, also, I don't know if uh, everyone caught it, but while we have the full attention, James, uh, the new president of Maymax, can you stand up again? And I'm putting you on the spot, so don't sit down. She's bringing you the mic to tell us um, about yourself. And we are all familiar with Maymax. We all knew Bob Umstead really well. So... You're now the new face. Can you give us a little introduction again? Yeah. Uh, my company is based in the construction. I'm a general contractor and I specialize in concrete. Um, I've been elected to, to be president because you know, I want to move a needle. I want to see uh, uh, us work with different agencies and work with chamber that has bigger than all of and this is where we can take this uh, as, as a team to move the needle. So that's one of the reasons that I decided to be the president. I've got a lot to learn and a lot of things, a lot of people to talk to. So give me a little time. Thanks. Thank you. Also, as we've been talking about it, and I touched, touched on it a little bit last month, but Tabor has moved forward with. Um, the business development center location. We put together a plan. We're out a meeting with uh, looking for uh, people to help fund it. And I uh, bought a hard copy, and one is on this side of the room. And and I'll put this one to where you can pass around of our proposal to let you know how serious we are. We have a complete proposal that we are presenting to people and going out meeting with. We've sent this already to the um, mayor, to the county exec. We've sent it to Vulcan. We're meeting with Washdot and others. But if you know of who else or you have contact, we are reaching out to people like Google, Amazon, Vulcan, others. We are also uh, want to present to prime contractors our concept and our plan to say if you know of anyone that we need to target, meet with, that can help fund what we are trying to do, let us know so we can go out and meet with them. The, uh, and I'm, I'm excited that you're here because in the proposal, um, James, and what Tabor is trying to do, and we were going to reach out to NAMAX and others, is a one-stop location where we are all housed. Uh, we've identified a place that we're still negotiating over on Rainier. Prime location, free parking. And here's one you can pass around over there. This is this is Marilyn's copy for when uh, to give to her. But it's it the vision is a one-stop shop. Uh, we have also the Urban League. The Urban League has agreed. She's gonna have hers to take with her. The Urban League want to uh, house uh, partner with us and house and put some of their programs inside of the one location. They were very impressed with the building. They saw where they could put their classrooms and take over the basement area of the building. But the vision is to where NAMAX, Tabor, all of the, uh, the minority community, everything, you come to one location. We are looking to have OMWBE there. We are looking to have whatever a minority business need in order to start a business, stay in business, whether it's how to do, respond to an RFP, whether you need legal service, whether you need back office support, whatever it is, you come to one location to get that. So when I say OMWBE is going to be there, let's say for an example, every Thursday, OMWBE is housed there with someone helping you get certified. You go, if you need to get certified, you come to the one location. Uh, if you need legal services, we will partner with a law firm to be there. If you need CPA services, whatever it is you need to run a business, technical assistance, we're not saying Tabor is going to do it. We're saying we will have the experts 
in those areas there and on the calendar. And uh, we will hopefully, if enough room, we will have our monthly meetings there. We are hoping that NAMAX is housed there, can have their meetings there. We're looking for people like, uh, and so I write, just so you know, I use you as an example all the time to say a company like Flyright, yeah, eat your breakfast, like Flyright, <laughs> that used to be over in Seattle in a location uh, that got pushed out high rent and things and now having to work from home to say this is their location. So we can bring businesses where you can also use that address and that becomes your location. Uh, we are really excited about the partnership with the Urban League and they, them wanting to be housed there. So can you imagine a location where Tabor, the minority community, African American community, the Urban League, NAMAX, and others that we are reaching out to are all housed in one location and you can come to one location and we see each other beautiful faces all the time. and. Uh, I think the biggest difference that that's going to make, there are a lot of the programs, people that offer different programs. PTAC might say, uh, next Wednesday we're going to do this over in Auburn. Vivian, you're having an outreach. Um, the city of Seattle have their outreach at different locations or at the city. But if everything is always at that one building, that one location, you're comfortable with seeing people that you recognize, people of color that have the same issues you're having, you're not embarrassed to say, hey, I need help with my financials, or I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. If you're comfortable to say, we all go through the same struggles, and you're coming to one location and you're getting the help you need, that I'm hoping we see more and more people reach out for the assistance that they need in order to run their businesses and stay in business. There is a lot of opportunities coming up. There's a lot of opportunities going on. And the number one thing that people like to say is, and we work with the various agencies that's very supportive, that's pushing goals and inclusion. And the last thing we need is for people to come back and say, hey, we can't find anyone. So we want to make that location to where every agency, every prime contractor, whoever knows, they can come into that one location and say, hey, I need a, a photographer for this job, or I need someone that does signs, or I need trucking. They know they have one, they can make one phone call, and we go find and say, here, and we walk you in and say, here, here's the company, we can vouch that they're ready and prepared to go to work. That's the goal, and that's what we want to create, and to make sure we are all there and being recognized, not overlooked, and not giving excuses to prime contractors, and not just contractors, the private sector. Everyone, there are others that's looking to be inclusive, that are saying, where are the firms? How do we participate? How do we be inclusive? Where do we go to find when we're looking for things? So that's the vision of having this one-stop location <coughs> in Seattle, free parking, plenty of space. We, I don't know if we will have a hot breakfast every morning. <laughs> but we will have coffee. <laughs> but that's the vision. And um, if you take a look at our plan that's being passed around the room, if you have any ideas, anything we've overlooked, let us know. Uh, Government Affairs, Real. All right, so um, you're going to receive in the newsletter soon. You're going to get some more information on the poll that we just did. Um, we did a poll on about repealing I-200, mostly focused on what the state thought about affirmative action. The poll numbers came back very good. 65% um, of people said that yes, Washington should have affirmative action programs in our government. Um, and if there was an initiative on the ballot to repeal, to reinstate the affirmative action law, 62% said yes. Um, and that is, all, that is very general. What's the total number? Of people, what? In the, people in the survey. How many people took the survey? 500. Okay. Which is a no, very no survey. The survey was done by um, LA Research, one of the top polling firms in the state. They've all, I've used them before. They're very accurate. Um, the last poll they did for New York Statewide was they, they, they 1% job. Okay. So 
which is a you know, more margin error, is about four and a half percent. Um, so the key thing, I looked at, when I look at the polls, I look at the demographics, of course. So 11% of it was in Seattle, the rest of it, 20% was in King County, and the rest was around the rest of the states. Okay. Um, 82% were of, of the people that polled were white. So these numbers were very um, encouraging because we polled people that really, that weren't usually knowledgeable about affirmative action right. um, to see what it was. So that helps if we do an education outreach, education campaign behind this kind of, to become an actual country, those numbers will go up. Because uh, a lot of people are very unaware, of, not just that uh, affirmative action doesn't exist here, but even the fact that what affirmative action is. Um, and we, I'm sure we've all had to have that conversation with people about what it is, and that it's not preferential treatment, it is just actual, you know, just better inclusion for what's going on. So that is going to be the focus of what we're going to be doing over the next few months and building for getting legislation passed either through. Olympia, or we do it on the ballot um, when we do a campaign and we look at the timeline. We're gonna, we, we do have a great chance to get this done um, by 2019, hopefully. You know, hopefully. Um, and so, this is you know, we're really on the progress of, doing, of getting this done. Um, I've been look, working on building a committee, um, getting some key figures around the state um, that can bring great resources to a campaign. So we're going to have to start fundraising for these kind of things, especially if it goes to the ballot. ballot Ballot issues cost at least a million dollars to, to do. There's going to be three ballot issues this year on the ballot. Actually, four, but three are gathering signatures right now. Um, and those are going to, they're going to spend about $4 million each on those campaigns. So if, if I can do a lot, we can do a lot cheaper here, but you know, if, we have, if we build up over time. But the thing is, the earlier we work now, the less we have to spend and less we have to raise to get this thing passed. Um, hopefully, we can get it done in the legislature. I've been having conversations with uh, there are other elected officials, and things are looking positive for this next session. Um, it's a longer session, so they get more done. And of course, now it's been on their radar since we had some pretty good success getting it through the Senate committee. Um, and of course, it's been in the House for a long time, so the fact that we built that momentum, hopefully we can carry it over into the next year of Olympia, so hopefully we can get um, this repealed by early 2019. So the, things are looking good. Um, what I do stress is if you do have some um, people, resources, or ideas to bring, please bring them to me. Like, you, know, the, you have the email, email to Government Affairs. Um, I did have a, a committee hearing, you know, a, a Government Affairs committee hearing. I do it at the uh, Columbia Tower. Um, I'm going to establish a monthly week. I had one on April 11th last week. So um, please show up to the next one. You'll have, you'll have more info. Um, of course, and there's free, free food and free parking there, too. So, uh, at the tower? <laughs> at the tower? The Columbia Tower is 75th floor, so please. Free parking? Um, what? I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. So, um, I'll take questions and um, any, any questions for me. But one, one last thing is, uh, like I said, this, this is going to take all of us. I've been taking, uh, I've been, I have been getting a lot of good feedback, just not um, the fact that people have been waiting for this to happen, and it's going to happen. So, a lot of key figures, a lot of other organizations are going to be jo joining on this, so it's not gonna, we're not going to have to carry the load on this. So. Um, we do have the support, we just have to get it together. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for taking this role. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have someone with your background in it, so we're honored to have you in that role. Well, like, School voice. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, it's a mic start. Just wanted to, first of all, thank you for serving uh, in this role. This is, uh, to have someone with your background in this capacity is tremendous. Um, two questions I had. Because we have really concentrated on business, and, and that is something that we should continue to focus on. However, I met a brilliant young lady the other day. Her name was Emma. And I'm sure she wouldn't need any special uh, access because she was brilliant. When I was her age, I wasn't so brilliant. And I know that education was also an area in which affirmative action was a, a very beneficial tool. And I'm wondering, uh, are we looking at that part of it as, as, as with one question? And the other question, are we considering some of those innovative tools like GoFundMe as it relates to collecting uh, dollars and, and human assets? Um, yes, education is definitely going to be a key part of this. Um, in terms of GoFundMe for fundraising, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the options, but usually you know, we can do online fundraising, especially run a campaign, which is 
you know, what will be um, um, done. I've not used up GoFundMe, but uh, all options are always on the table. In terms of the education piece, um, we're going to have mostly two options. Either we repeal it with, you know, reinstate affirmative action like it was. Um, ballot, if you do a ballot issue, that's likely we're going to go for it. You know, if you do a ballot issue, you go for it all and you, know, you, you force the legislature's hand. Um, if we get it past the legislature, there might be a little, you know, um, modifications with doing the education piece. Um, but we're going to also want the input from education officials, like people from the universities, on what the best methods for that that will, we think can get through the legislature. Um, Texas did a certain version of this where they, and they, they made a rule of 10% of all high school graduates, uh, the top 10% of all high school graduates, got admitted to state universities no matter what. Um, and they adjusted it throughout the state. The University of Texas, I think, lowered it to 7% for capacity issues because. 7% for them is still a lot when they got 67,000 students. So um, that we have looked into a version of that. Um, we got some good feedback through legislature because you got to reach across the aisle sometimes and Republicans were more open to that side. Um, but if it does, we can't get something like that. If it doesn't go through legislature, we'll go to ballot issue and we're just going to go for it all. And so that, those are the options we're looking at. And um, so yeah, we're, I'm, 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 I'm a, you know, for me personally, I'm, not, I'm a key, key advocate for education inclusion, so we're, we're not going to take education off the table. <coughs> Any other comments? Okay, we'll move on to Section 3. Thank you. Okay, uh, education, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Got uh, three things I want to cover pretty quickly. First of all, Today, in addition to our general meeting, is Mesa Day, that's Math, Engineering, Science, Achievement, and one of our favorite members and Education Committee uh, members, Calvin Saunders, is representing Table 100 along with a couple of other people uh, at the Mesa Day event at the University of Washington. There will probably be someone named about 100 to 150 middle and young high school students there competing in teams by school, and Table 100 sponsors usually the egg drop event where students eat to find protect an egg through an eight-foot ball. And uh, usually there's lots of scrambled eggs at the bottom, that's an awful lot of fun, and the kids get to compete and try out their technical skills. Um, at some point, uh, Table 100 usually makes a donation to Mesa as well, and it's something that we do annually, and it's a great way for us to be involved with the community. A couple uh, meetings ago, I started talking to you about scholarship interviews through the YMCA. Table 100 has a scholarship uh, dedicated to past member Mel Streeter, and we make that uh, determination through the YMCA and the Garfield Scholars and some of the other YMCA programs here in the region. On the 12th of May, there will be interviews for somewhere between 8 to 10 students. I've got three or four people lined up to be on a panel. I could use one or two more, especially for backup on that day. It will be pretty much an all-day event because there will be 45 minutes to an hour for each of the students. So you'll start around 8.30 or 9, and you won't be done until 4.30 or 5. But you'll meet some great students, and you'll help these students move through the process of getting scholarship dollars not only from Table 100, but through another eighteen dollars to $20,000 of scholarship money available through the YFCA. Again, if you're interested in being on that panel on May 12th, contact me, education at table100.org. And the last piece I want to mention is that we have applications out for green energy scholarship as well as a culinary scholarship through Table 100. The applications are available on the Table website. They're also available through www.washboard.org. That's an organization that pushes scholarships out to students who uh, register with that organization. Other uh, schools and community members have these scholarship applications as well. If you know of students who are interested in green energy, energy sustainability, technical things, it would be the green energy scholarship. If you know of someone who's interested in the hospitality industry or uh, being a chef or the culinary industry, then it would be that scholarship. Again, the deadline for those scholarship applications is the 18th of May, not the 19th, not the 20th. <laughs> so I have a question. So since you're talking about culinary, is there any way we could tie the culinary with the the, um, the dessert dash? 
No? Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Not the scholarship. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Are you able to get some of the maybe. students who are doing. A prior recipient, maybe, of a culinary award? And maybe. But I'll be asking some of those folks if they can bake something for the. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maybe part of the what's the, process. What's the status of the education levy? The new mayor is talking about changing the education levy to do a lot more uh, early childhood. It's kind of, it, looks, it sounds like it's going to be broader. It sounds like they're going to be putting part of the money that would normally be by itself for the uh, Seattle preschool program that was at one point separate from the uh, families and education levy. Those two have been combined under the Department of Education and Early Learning over at the city. And so the ask this time around looks like it's going to be something really large, like around $600,000 instead of the past one, which has been a separate request family and education levy, just about $260,000, something like that. Excuse me, a million. You're right, thank you. <laughs> um, in any case, they brought those two divisions together under the Department of Education and Early Learning, so timing for both of these previously separate levies is now the same. And so just combine them, put them together, it's going to be a large ask, especially since there have been a number of big tax asks in the last couple of years. But the community has largely supported education. And from my standpoint, um, the Amazon Headquarters 2 beauty contest should be a really huge knock on the door for the community because we're unable to provide Amazon and other tech companies with the workers that they need. There are 60,000 open tech and knowledge work positions in the state right now. This is not the first year we've had that many job openings available. UW and Wazoo and the other schools cannot fill the pipeline of graduates. We need to do a whole bunch of things. Starts with education and the sooner we start, the earlier kids, especially kids who look like me, will be prepared to be employees for Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, and to start their own business. And people in here too. They're your employees. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, Anthony? Oh. Yeah. I, I had uh, asked you uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, about the uh, scholarship to pay for member kids, and you were going to get back to me on that. The reason why I asked that is I've had, since I've been a member of Tabor, I've had three kids go to college, two of them graduated, and I got one now that's getting ready to go to college. The applications uh, on the best of you. Fields that they're in the study for. One's an engineer, one's a biology major. And my daughter now is a, uh, a sports medicine major. So I'm just, I'm just asking questions. Well, the one scholarship covers no matter the the Mill Streeter or the. The Mel Streeter Scholarship is pretty much locked into the University of Washington. So if they're going to the University of Washington, then there's a possibility that they could get that scholarship. Uh, it's also tied into the YMCA. But part of your issue is one of two things. If we had millions of dollars available to us to apply just for scholarships and that work, we would do it. Since we don't have that, what I will offer to you is that Yes, there are some scholarships that are open, and we have some other scholarship arrangements with other organizations like uh, Seattle University. That's a particular set of scholarships for students coming in for business. But we can partner with other organizations and other resources to get scholarship information out to people. So I'm certainly going to offer myself. Your daughter can call me. I'm willing to meet with her, talk with her, and help her find other scholarships that can help her fund her college career. And also, I think on the Green Energy Scholarship, it's called the Green Energy Scholarship, but to, for clarity, uh, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong, is if you're majoring in something, it doesn't have to be in utilities or directly green energy, but doing the scholarship process on the essay paper, if they write how whatever it is they're majoring in pertain to green energy. So it's in the essay writing that they can say what I'm majoring in pertains to green energy and how that ties in. They still qualify to apply for the Green Energy Scholarship. 
For example, if you can persuade me that your art history major is going to further green energy, turn it. Or renewable energy, whatever you want to call it. You send us your pitch, we'll take a look at it. Utilities hire art history majors. <laughs> Where? That's why I included art history majors. It's got to be STEAM. Yeah, can I, I just want to offer some comments um, because my daughter graduated about two years ago now, but it was through Tabor that glimpsed the scholarships that she took with her going into college. Um, one, one was the Green Energy, the PSE Green Energy Scholarship, and I remember being at a Tabor meeting and going up um, to the committee members here and saying, is there any reason that she couldn't apply? Um, but with that, she also applied for three other scholarships that were connections that Tabor had with other organizations. That being said, um, she is now a civil engineer with a structural emphasis. And the biggest bang, I don't know if Tabor knows this, but you guys featured her in your gala immediately. Next week, she probably had 30 calls yep. from different employers saying, we want you. <laughs> so don't have to ask them the power of Tabor to really help our kids. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Uh, Bobby? Another um, testimonial. Um, my son is also a recipient of the Green Energy Scholarship. He's a student uh, at the University of South, uh, Southern California, majoring in computer science, computational math, and uh, electrical engineering. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what the connection was, but he articulated it in the uh, application uh, pretty clearly and was a recipient, and it's really made a difference. He's about a year out uh, from, from completing, and uh, these scholarships really make a difference in these young folks' lives. Uh, both the funds, the recognition, the support of our community, uh, and he was actually at school at the time that won. He wasn't able to come to the gala, but uh, I called him at the time that the gala was going on, and he said, he said, let Tabor and the community know that I'm gonna do him proud. So, so it means a lot. And he wasn't at the gala, but he was on the uh, brochure that was at the gala of who we've given scholarships to. And the governor, when he came up, actually acknowledged him verbally at the gala and what he was majoring in. So my, I think the point here is participate. Uh, fill out the application, get involved, encourage your kids to get involved, to come to the meetings, to understand uh, what it is we're doing. But as you said, don't underestimate the value of Tabor. And sometimes I think we do, but uh, don't underestimate the value of Tabor. Yes. Good morning. I only have one quick announcement on May the 5th, 15th. From four to seven, we're having the Tabor and Vulcan Northwest Business Expo. We have identified 47 companies who are going to showcase to make sure that you come, attend. It's a free event, so tell as many people as possible to support these businesses and see what they can do to uh, help further uh, their business. Where will it, where will it be? Oh, I'm sorry. It's at Century. Century. From four to seven. Uh, May the 15th. And this is another example of Tabor and, and the uh, businesses out there taking advantage of the opportunities because this is where you can be the uh, person show, showcasing your business and what you do. Uh, it is amazing how many people, and I was actually sitting in a meeting, a board meeting down at the liquor uh, control board and a person was there giving a presentation and because I'm pushing inclusion in what that agency is doing as far as inclusion and how are we meeting the governor's expectation. And the person from our agency was there and was talking about the different things that she's doing and how we are doing outreach. And she mentioned that particular event that the, uh, the agency is going to be at looking for firms 
of who the agency can use. Uh, we use Flyright to do pictures and stuff for the uh, Liquor Control Board and stuff. It is amazing if you think outside, because people always think our focus is construction, but take your vision outside of construction to say there's opportunity for all of us if we participate, show up, and talk about what our business is and what we do. And I don't know, Anthony, how many of the businesses because we did an outreach to minority businesses, period. How many of them are tabled? Like four or five. Four or five? Yeah. About four or five? For sure. Right. Out of how many we're having? Uh, 47. Out of 47 businesses that responded to participate in Showcase, only about four or five are Tabor businesses. And we have over 150 businesses. You've got to be willing to do your part because I, I hate when people come to the meeting and say, hey, I didn't get this contract or I'm being overlooked or uh, they, uh, such and such is not using me. You guys have to be willing to participate and showcase your business. And I think uh, going back to the development center, all of that is going to help in those areas. But, uh, and I understand a lot of people are, of our businesses, you are owners and you're out there every day on the job. And so I do understand it's hard, but you, you got to find the time to showcase and let people see who you are and what your business is and it's not just for construction on what we do. Uh, with that, I, uh, Julie, and Daniel with Intelligent Partners represent uh, some uh, upcoming contracts. So they're gonna come up and talk about their role and how they're here to re look out for inclusion. And then from there, we're going to cut off the cameras and go into some candid conversations. Again, thanks for having us. My name is Julie Diao, and we are uh, Intelligent Partnerships. We're a third-party um, administrative uh, company. We do third-party administration for project labor agreements and uh, community workforce agreements in uh, Seattle and uh, other areas uh, in the country. Um, we have been servicing this area now since uh, 2015. Um, and we're working on two uh, larger projects currently, uh, one being the CFJC, the uh, Children, Family, and Justice Center with King County, um, and the other that we are uh, working on is the Washington State Convention Center. Um, our goal as a third party administrator is to make sure that you know we're administrating the PLA and just making sure that everything that's in that PLA as far as inclusion, as far as uh, diverse workers, and what have you, that the crime contractors are actually doing what that, what it says. We're holding them accountable and making sure that we have um, the businesses and the workers that are coming onto the job sites, uh, making sure that everybody is going to meet and exceed the numbers um, that they are committed to in those contracts. Um, we are um, very happy that we were recently able to acquire um, a few key employees in Los Angeles and here as well, but here, uh, Dee Riley, which uh, it took me a long time to get to Darling Nava, but Darling is her real name. Um, we were very fortunate in, in hiring her as our Director of Community um, and uh, DBE Engagement. And also, um, it, well, she was formerly with, with Lighting. And also, uh, Jelena uh, Siufanua. She is, uh, was formerly with STP, and uh, both of them worked on the DBE side so that we have a nice team together to make sure that everything is being taken care of on both of our projects. Um, if you have not met um, Darling or Jelena, I would really strongly and really, really appreciate it if you can give them your uh, business cards so that we can keep a roster of where you are. Very often in uh, both of the projects, sometimes there's work that comes up and they come to us and ask us, hey, who do we have next and we can find something, uh, Darling has been key to that for us, but we want to make sure that we're um, including everybody um, in, in this type of work, in the work that we have going on with these two projects. Now our team 
works with you in being able to, we have a, a team member that will help you get your paperwork done to be ascended into the project or the community workforce agreement. We take you through that whole process. We actually are uh, very involved with the labor side of things and the unions, and we work with them as well to make sure that everything is, is going exactly the way it should in the processes. We also are able to help you with um, figuring out um, how, you know, as far as the, the wages and the pay scales, prevailing wage, all those things we're very experienced in. So we want you to, even if you're not on the project, if you, you know, need a card, if you need to ask us a question, we're more than open to do that. On the Children, Family, and Justice Center, um, King County is the owner of that project and has, uh, it was, you know, King County made provisions for us to be able to work on that project. So when we're helping you out and getting your business incorporated into these projects, there's no charge for the services that we provide you. So um, sometimes it comes up to you know language and making sure that those RFQs are making sure that your bids are okay. Um, although we are not attorneys, we definitely understand how to get the processes done and are more than glad to help you um, in that service. Um, Daniel Liao, um, who is uh, one of our technical um, advisors and a subject matter expert for us in project labor agreement and in labor and in apprenticeship and a whole lot of other things. Um, he's also my husband. He is my husband. Um, he uh, is um, very inspirational. Um, our goal, um, not only as a family, but as our intelligent partnerships family, is to make sure that we have an even playing field. We're not asking for anybody to, you know, to pass somebody else, jump over, do anything else, and a lot of the misconceptions are out there. We want to make sure that there's access for absolutely everybody, all of the same, based on everything that we're doing. We are very happy to work with you. My passion is the workforce, and making sure that we have women businesses, women definitely um, stepping up, and a lot of us worked, a lot of us worked, um, and getting our husbands through school and making sure everything was okay culturally. Um, the Latino culture, that's what we did. I worked when he went to school, but now we're working together. We were working together before, but we are continuing to work together to make sure that we're making a difference in our communities. So um, I'm going to let Daniel elaborate a little bit more on the projects and give you some more information. Thank you. Somebody had to pay the bills, right? <laughs> she just made it, makes it pop. Uh, so first of all, just thank you so much for including us in the conversation this morning. It's been a tremendous uh, privilege to be a part of the Seattle family for uh, the last handful of years. You know, we're, we're from Los Angeles, that's where we started our work. And uh, uh, just to see um, uh, the footprint that we've been able to create and the network of friends that we've been able to create here uh, and, and this, uh, the work that has progressed both through the city, the county, uh, and the other uh, uh, places where we've been able to influence policy uh, has allowed our, our small business to really begin to uh, roll out a national uh, footprint. Uh, and it's all because of what has happened with our partnerships here in Seattle. So this place uh, holds a special importance to us. Um, and the work that we're unfolding is really designed to, as Julie explained, uh, to, to create a level playing field. Uh, oftentimes, we're, when you hear the word PLA or, or community workforce agreement, uh, right away the red flags and the buzzers start going off and oh, oh now I gotta be union and I gotta do this and I gotta do that. But it's really about accountability. It's really about making sure everybody that plays is playing by the same rules. Uh, and that means that sometimes we can't cut corners. We also got to deliver the outcome, right? Um, and so we got to hold ourselves accountable uh, um, and be uh, in, in, uh, uh, players uh, within integrity our, ourselves as we're moving through these processes. And that requires oftentimes some hand-holding and some education. And that's really the role that our company uh, has tried to play, is to really make sure that everybody understands and is educated uh, about what, what these different partnerships and relationships mean and how to interact with these programming models. You know, there's a reason why when you, when you hear the word PLA and apprenticeship, you think of two things, construction and union. It's a, it's a business practice that these folks figured out nearly 100 years ago. It's a business model. 
It's a, it's a market capture strategy that they've designed in order to capture the biggest work. And so um, their businesses are making money on a consistent basis and have been for 100 years. So why can't we play in the same pool? And we just have to understand the rules and how, and how they operate because they're supposed to operate the same for everyone. And so what Intelligent Partnerships has done is we've designed policies to make sure that we're included in that process. And our, uh, our role in that process is holding the crimes accountable, acting as a liaison on behalf of the owner, on behalf of the crimes, uh, working uh, to help uh, small businesses and, and others navigate the, the labor environment so that they're understanding, so that when they hear certain words, they're actually understanding what those words mean uh, and not interpreting them through their own lens, right? But everybody is speaking the same language that's part of the role that we play. In addition to that, it's creating the work access. You know, we're, we're involved in a, in a controversial project here in Seattle with the Children and Family Juvenile Justice Center. A lot of folks believe that, or, and, and rightly so, that this is designed, that, that this building itself is designed to exclude us, to, to capture us and keep us in boxes. But the reality is that uh, the job creation and the contractor access that's created through that project model offers an opportunity to divert the pathway into the building. If we can build that building and then move to another building, it's much better than, uh, than waiting for our turn to sit inside of that building for an extended period of time. And that's really um, the message that we should be focused on. Um, we're, we're trying to make sure that, uh, that we're creating as much opportunity, uh, to, you know, the taxpayers have spoken and the building's going to get built. So if it's going to get built and it's going to get impact our communities, then our community should be benefiting from the, from the investment that's being made there and we should be generating family transforming career opportunities through that venture that, that will help divert as many lives away from having to spend time inside of that building. And it's our responsibility to own that. Right? So we're, we're doing everything that we can to help in that regard. We also have the other opportunity around the Washington State Convention Center. This is an extended project. We know everybody's talking about it as a three-year construction window. The reality is that's a seven to nine-year construction window. It's multi-billion dollars, multi-tiered uh, programming that's going to be happening there. They're going to need every type of contractor. And they're facing uh, really unique challenges uh, in terms of the workforce density, right? The workforce is not available. The contractor base is not available. So we have an opportunity to take new young minds, young entrepreneurs, educate them, ramp them up, and get them involved in, in, uh, in Seattle's marketplace in a way that's powerful right now so that they could experience positive, a positive business environment for the first 10 years of their business experience, right? So that we can build up the companies that have been around here for a while, give them in this positive construction environment, give them the opportunity to grow to that next level. If you're, if you're doing, you know, 800,000, 1.5, 3.2 million dollars in, in business a year now, you need to move up to the five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year. This is the window of time for you to build up that reservoir of, uh, of business aptitude so that you can capture that work. And so Intelligent Partnerships vision is to help you get all of the information that you need to do that. And we're proud to partner uh, with Tabor and, and other NAMAC and other communities, uh, uh, other organizations in the, in the community that are focused on the same vision and mission. And we're available to answer any questions that you have, but please, connect with Darling and the rest of Intelligent Partnerships because uh, there are ample opportunities for you to participate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make it easier for you. <laughs> Daniel, great job that you're doing here in our community. I had a, a, a meeting a couple weeks ago and part of what I do is work with contractors, open shop, and, and union. And part of what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage folks to consider using organized labor uh, as part of their model is to identify the advantages as well as those obstacles. And work, having that experience, obviously knowing that some, some of our smaller firms don't have those cash flow uh, uh, assets um, that others may possess. But I was in a meeting 
and I heard something mentioned, and I've been working with union contractors for 25 years. I've never heard this before, and so I'm mentioning it now. And I'm wondering if this is something that you could do within your organization. I was told that in certain aspects, uh, union contractors that are typically required to pay every week uh, according to prevailing wage can actually, if they communicate and work, you know, have proactively negotiate with their client or with their owner and their um, the union, that they may actually pay every two weeks. That has a huge impact on our small businesses. Never knew that that was even an option. There is also opportunities where you have market recovery when you're working on a private project and there's other union contractors uh, competing and they'll give you a little discount against your wage. And so there's these benefits of being a signatory contractor, but not all of us know. And so if we're, if we're gonna continue to try to encourage some of our folks like Faison, who's you know doing well both in uh, Portland as well as Seattle. <clears throat> so if we could find a way to give folks a little works, a fact sheet that could kind of give folks the impression, because you, you obviously have impression both from the field and from being a person of color. I mean, it's so you understand, but. Yeah, there's a reason why I'm not pushing a ladder and pushing a pencil. Because <laughs> I figured out exactly that, that, uh, that uh, the opportunities are limited when you don't know how the, how, what the playing field actually is. But you're absolutely right. One of the things that Intelligent Partnerships has really taken uh, to heart is the idea that we're a neutral uh, party, right? That we're, that we're really working to build, to be the glue between uh, these universes that exist around the construction sector um, um, that have, have historically been um, separated from each other, both from the purchaser standpoint, but also from the union and non-union standpoint. And there are benefits to being a union contractor. Our, my job is not to organize union contractors, but we certainly uh, wouldn't shy away from creating an information piece uh, that would help people understand some of the benefits. I mean, what, one of the most tangible benefits, that, and yet you're absolutely right, um, union contractors, especially mid-sized to large-sized uh, uh, contractors do have uh, the ability to tap some of the financial resources that uh, their labor partners represent, because they're, you know, they're holding trust funds, right? Because they collect that trust fund payment every week. They collect it. So every month, all, all their contractors are contributing. So they have trust fund dollars that are for the advancement of the training of their workforce. Those pools of money, they're, they're part of those trust funds' responsibility is to advance the construction penetration of that market. And so they use that to create uh, resources for their contractors when they're bidding for projects, when they're uh, trying to offset wages against a, a, a lower wage competitor, when they're trying to uh, you know, deal with uh, uh, payment schedules that may be off cycle because they're in a public sector environment or whatever, right? So, so they do help their contractors that way. One of the most valuable things uh, that I see as a, uh, in, a, in the signatory contractor environment is your ability to field a trained workforce of any size uh, to participate in a contracting environment. You know, the fact that you're a two, three person shop, and um, uh, uh, um, but, uh, if you're a signatory contract, it allows you to pursue work that requires, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 bodies because you know you can just call the union hall and dispatch the workers that are trained and available. And you, you can actually reduce your crew composition cost by using apprenticeship as part of that mix, right? So you can you can uh, uh, design your uh, your crew composition to lower the the, the wage rate that, that you actually have to come out of pocket with. So there's a there's a significant <coughs> amount of value to being in that environment, and and so we'll come into you right now that Intelligent Partnerships will develop a, a one sheet on on uh, an informative for uh, non-signatory contractors to understand some of the benefits and the value of uh, of uh, on the unionized uh, side of the, of the construction house. Um, but also, um, I think it's also important for us to share some of, the, some of the components that are important to understand when you're participating in the types of projects that we're uh, overseeing. So for example, uh, the fact that you have to actually pay the benefit component, you can't pay it on the, on the check, you have to pay it into the trust fund. 
and what that means to your cash flow, et cetera. So we'll, we'll design some, um, uh, a couple of different informatives and make sure that Tabor gets access to those. Okay. Was there another question before we move on? I think have one other hand. He already answered it. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we're going to turn off the cameras. The chamber is like, why are we putting out paying for this particular role? And I never see minorities, the people coming and going and participating in anything. We have to show up and support people that are representing us. That is so important. And I hope we don't just shake our head and say yes and that we do that. And I also reached out to your assistant, just so you know, earlier this week. That's the reason I know you just got back in town and you're leaving again next week. Uh, but I did reach out to get on your calendar so we could start the dialogue yes. of working together. Absolutely. Yes. And my executive assistant is African American. I could tell when I got the phone, I told somebody in my office, I, I could tell. But I was insulted. She didn't know who I was. Okay. 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 I was like, you don't know me. I think Tabor one. I started out saying Tabor one hundred, and I was like, oh, my clothes are hurt. No, 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 she didn't. Do you know her Regina Glenn? So she didn't even know who Regina. Okay. Uh, with that, are there any other comments? Any other dialogue that we want to go into? We are off camera. Um, no, I, turn, I started is, again. Oh, well. I'll turn it off. Okay.